the biggest title defense of your career. Any trepidation tonight? You're no journalist, Green Bean. You're missing the story here. The story here is romance. The lovely Elizabeth We Wendt know, we know she's head over heels for you, right? <laughs> Even this bozo can see it. She wants you honky, she wants you bad. And I'm going to oblige her. Being a gentleman, I am the honky-tonk man. What are gonna... you saying? What are you saying, man? What I'm saying is this. I've got the title, I've got the belt, and tonight... I'm going to get the woman, the lonely woman. Oh, no. And then where are you going to take her, honky? Where, where are you going to take her, honky? I'm going to take her down a lonely street <laughs> to the heartbreak hotel. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Don't you worry. I won't be cruel. Sing it, baby. Because I know she wants me to love her tender. Sing it. Because I'll be her. Teddy bear. <laughs> too much, too and much. you know where that hound dog Randy's going to be? Where's he going to be? In the ghetto. <laughs> oh, Vince, Go, I baby. just hope Elvis, Go, the real Elvis, doesn't hear that. Let's get back to you. Hello and welcome to OSW Review, the only wrestling podcast out on the net. So yes, number one, and we're here today to talk about... What are we here today to talk about? Royal Rumble 88. Nice. nice. Will that do? <laughs> Alright, thanks for joining us. Jay Hunter here with V1. How's it going, Jay? What's the story? Pretty good. Just think about last week's show. I think it's awesome. <laughs> Amazing. We're brilliant. Would you say it was our best show ever? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Just those teams tonight, and we're going to be talking about the 1988 Royal Rumble. Now, get two things out of the way. Last week you said, um, you know, this is the first pay-per-view that's not a pay-per-view. That's not a pay-per-view, yeah, that's great. Because this first one, uh, it was an experiment, so they just put it live on USA Network. Ooh, I always thought this was a house show. Hmm. 18,000 people in it as well. Mm, Cops Coliseum, that's right. Yeah, in Hamilton, Ontario, in Canada. You know the way Survivor Series, Vince being a cunt about it, put it on the same day as Starcade 87? I do, yeah. Yeah, Royal Rumble 88. Any reason why he picked January 24th, 1988 is the same day as NWA's Bunkhouse Stampede really? on pay-per-view. And did that have the Bunkhouse bra? <laughs> with uh, Blacktop Polila. <laughs> it was a piece of shit show from Long Island, so never. It was gonna fail anyway, but Vince is having none of it. Like, genius. The UFC do that now, don't they? If there's a rival MMA company with a show on that night, then they'll show a previous pay per view for free on Spike. And they generally show one, like, with Brock on it. So, you know, that's gonna garner 2 million views. It's massively cuntish, but it's genius at the same time. Mm. It's great. We were both watching the WWE version this time, the anthology version, because there was no VHS release back in 88. Ah, about time. <laughs> it makes me angry when I have to watch 40 more minutes than you do. open with Rick Roots theme playing as Vince runs down the cars. We got the official signing of Hogan vs. Andre, the Jumping Bomb Angels vs. the Glamour Girls in a 2 out of 3 falls match for the WWF Tag Team Ladies Championship, Dino Bravo attempting to break the world bench lift record, and the Islanders vs. the Stallions in another 2 out of 3 falls match. And then of course the 20 man Royal Rumble. First thing I noticed, America Ropes. Yeah, I love it. Actually, the first thing I copped was that uh, my sex jazz music was gone for uh, Rude's music. And um, next, you'll be telling me Vince's smoking jacket's gone. Right? I know! What, what's, what's happening there? And um, did you see the amazing page turning effect? <laughs> I loved it. It was great. Whenever I'm editing this, I'll use the page turn. I think that, that'll be it. Like. <laughs> Star White Band, we're out. <laughs> Our first match is Rick Rude versus Ricky Steamboat, yeah, with his shit cover theme. Yeah. I don't know, we give out about this all the time, or, yeah, it is really annoying. It's, it's like, it's not the fact that it's a bad song, because it's not that bad, it's just the fact that his real song is so amazing. Did you know that the uh, Irish football team use it when they're coming out? Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Ventura notes that Rude is the first ever Jesse the Body Award winner. I love the heel, uh, he grabbed the tights on. 
Yeah, we got our first test of strength on WWF pay per view. You know, they started going for the. It was mean, the first time that ever yeah, happened yeah. in the. I'd always mention it. Like that's that's one of the spots that I love. That oh. is synonymous with eighties wrestling. So the first time you've seen it, I just felt it looked like a showcase for Rude's physique, because he was just flexing when he was holding his arms. Like, yeah. Do you know Rude? He has a tattoo of an anchor. It looks the same as HBK's. Ooh. HBK has a heart though around it though. Oh. So it's, okay, right. it's more of a dagger and a heart than a than a yo ho sailor. Like. <laughs> Or, you know, maybe he got it to make him think about the time when all the sailors battered him. <laughs> he does like hot sailors. Actually, he likes hot sea. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I think Popeye has the same tattoo and about the same size forearms as well. Oh, seriously, I, I just took one look at this guy and the only thing I could think of was, no wonder you're dead. It was really sad. When I whacked this on, my uh, dad walked in the room. He just walked in and said, Holy crap, is that Rick Rude? And uh, I was like, yes, it is. Then he just turned around and said, I take it he's dead, yeah? <laughs> uh, so, you know, I gave him one of those looks and yeah, dead. Massive heart attack. Lobster. Did you notice his back knee, by the way? I did. It was scary. Whenever was they pan in, 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 he turn around and they pan away immediately. But yeah, oh my, he, had he some was serious... absolutely covered in it. Um, I characterised this whole match by one move, an endless armbar. Yeah. Whatever home happens, they have a few exchanges, it goes faster, and it inevitably ends up back in an armbar. Pretty much. Um, I thought this match was really fucking boring, if I'm being honest with you. When I see Ricky the Dragon Steamboat come out, I expect match of the night, and uh, not six minutes of an armbar, followed by an armbar. Did you see the spot where Steamboat broke out of his armbar? And he did the Daniel Bryan grab your arm twisty thing. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a really cool spot. Although Daniel Bryan does it better. <laughs> Rude applies the camel clutch and Steamboat starts tapping out. But uh, yeah, no tap outs for the next yeah. 10 years. Not until uh, 97. <laughs> Ken Shamrock brought it in. Yeah, we got the first water maneuver by Vince. Uh, as Steamboat used the electric chair to escape the camel clutch. Some asshole fan on the hard camera with the Jimmy Hart megaphone. Yeah, um, he was so loud and obnoxious that the commentators had to actually talk about him. Uh, I think it was a girl. I'm pretty sure it was a mom. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, either way, um, they were really loud and really annoying. Uh, I think Vince tried to kind of bob it off as a joke, like saying, Oh, I love this merch, is selling well. But uh, it took away even more from the match. It just bugged me. Yeah, yeah, it was really annoying, I thought. How would WWF get her to shut the fuck up? Like, would you just go over there and take it off her? Or, but it's if it's WWF March, you probably couldn't, you know. So it's a uh, good point, actually. Yeah, because it started off with her just, you know, cheering on Steamboat and giving it to Rue, but then it degenerated into her just going <laughs> on the megaphone. <laughs> like, so I was like, Fuck. are you sure that that was her, or like she wasn't pressing buttons to like a <laughs> sound clips of? <laughs> Jimmy Hart laughing and things like that. <laughs> Did you notice how kind of backwards the opening five or ten minutes of this match was? It was like Dragon was the heel working on Rude with his armbar and his long bouts of boringness, and and <laughs> then it uh, and then that would be broke up with uh, Rude making a quick comeback, only to then have his arm worked on more. Very good, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, pissed yeah. me off. Like Steamer tries to get the crowd to clap. But no love, it was great. He would just kept slapping the ground and you know what Christian does it like <laughs> That's, and he gets yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, then I think Jesse even made a comment about how his timing was off. <laughs> <laughs> that he that he like wasn't getting a good rhythm going and that's what the fans were enchanting. That's amazing. He so, Jesse's body mentor was so awesome in this match. There was a point where Rude hit Dragon with a suplex from the outside back in to the ring. And then pose to show off his awesome ride buddy. And then uh, Jesse Ventura goes, Oh, isn't he great? He reminds me of me. <laughs> I just thought that was fantastic. Before the finish, this match went from shit to being really awesome for about, about a minute. They had like a series of about seven or eight near falls in the space of 10, 15 seconds. Okay, and the uh, spot. it totally got the fans back into the match. Mm. Like they were silent. So the finish is Rude pulls the ref into the way when Steamer goes for a top rope chuck. Rude does a one-sided torture rack. The ref calls it and Rude's team plays and he goes out and Rude thinks he's the winner. And Vince calls it, Rude thinks he's won. Yeah, I've made that note of, but which side is he on? It's just... <laughs> Uh, he totally gave it away. Yeah. Really, really bad commentary. 
So obviously Fink says it's a DQ and the winner is Ricky Steamboat. So overall I felt a very disappointing match really. Endless arm bars and you can really tell Rude was on the way up and Steamer, man, he was on the way out. Totally. Um, like I said er earlier, when I see uh, Steamboat come out I expect a great match. This wasn't very good. Cut to Oakland and Ventura as they explain Dino Bravo's bench press attempt. The world record of 705 pounds. Do you want to talk us through this? I would love to. Um, Did you fast forward it? No, I, I, <laughs> I watched all of this. I thought it was great. Me and Gene talks to uh, Jesse Ventura first, who says that he is a uh, Dino Bravo spotter for his world record safety stuff. So Dino Bravo comes out with his manager, Frenchie Martin, who <laughs> is an awesome stereotype. He's great. Dino Bravo kicks off at 415 pounds, which he does absolutely no problem. It makes, it, it looks very simple for him. Like he's a big dude. He's like not the eighties wrestler ripped, but just in terms of sure mass, he actually looks like a bodybuilder to me, you know? It doesn't look like a gimmick, it looks like He's a bodybuilder turned wrestler, like, he's a big guy. Did you get the feeling that this segment was more interesting to the wrestlers than it would be for all of the fans? I'm sure that, like, Jesse Ventura and Vince absolutely love this, because, you know, Vince is a huge bodybuilding yeah. fan, and I thought it was really funny how uh, Jesse Ventura kept on shouting at Vince, telling him how little he knows about bodybuilding, and you're, you're not into this. I thought it was a great touch, like. We went from 415 up to 505. Uh, which he does grand again, multiple small pumps. Yeah, he makes 505 look like a paperweight. It's very, very impressive. Then up to 555, uh, where he's straining a bit more, but it's grand. Great line by Gene Mean, where, <laughs> where he says, No noise, please. It's a source of distraction. <laughs> to the band. I thought Mean Gene was great in this segment. Just in terms of getting that little rise out of the fans, I thought he was brilliant. Because obviously uh, Dino Brown was a heel, so they're trying to get fans to start booing him and stuff, and so every time the crowd would boo, he'd get a little more annoyed. Yeah, they moved up to 5.95. Bravo got really good healy to hear Every time he'd go to lift it up and he'd hear the fans boo, he'd get back up and start shouting at the fans. When he got to 5.95, you could see it was beginning to get a bit difficult for him. He, he was doing single pushes at this point, you know, he was taking a bit longer. Mm. Frenchy Martin here, he only speaks in French, but not much heel heat. I thought that that's guaranteed heat, like. They're in Canada, right? Oh shit, yeah, yeah, yeah shit. Then, if you come off his face, because Bravo's Canadian as well. Maybe they should have had your man Pumperdink as his manager, because yeah. it wasn't his gimmick that he sounded English, because yeah. the French hated him. He should, oh man, maybe only in 97. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> or the heel's face, so, I, man, yeah, if he's in Canada, they should, they should be cheering him. Yeah. Um, that's right, he's fucking Canadian. Yeah, yeah. I guess, you know, kayfabe and full effect. A lot there, of backward booking so so far on this show. Mm. Mean Jean said something awesome to Frenchie. He said, I know well you can speak English. <laughs> Just like every foreigner. <laughs> Only when they're alone, though. Oh, it's great. 6.55, there's just one pump, just barely, and then at 7.15, this is an unofficial weight because the bar will have to be weighed later, but this will break the world bench press record. I thought that was a brilliant line. Jesse Ventura was amazing in this segment. Bravo actually walks out first because of the fans were booing him. Jesse starts giving out to the crowd saying that if you hate him or love him, you should be cheering him on because he's going to set a new world record people and it's because of you that you're not going to see it. Bravo came back, blah, 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 and he couldn't actually push it to bar, and Jesse obviously helped him pull it up. Then as Bravo kind of celebrates around with his arms up, Vince talks over everyone saying that, I don't think he got it, Jesse. I just, shut the fuck up, Vince. You really <laughs> annoy me. His voice sounds so fake. It pisses me off. Is very American showbiz. And yeah. Ventura pleased that he didn't clasp his hands around the bar. It was just for safety. Vince would get on his case about it for the rest of the night. Yeah, it was it pretty was, fun. It was great. Overall, did you like this segment? <sighs> Overall, I was I was entertained by this segment, but I think it would have been a lot better if they had gone from like 550, 600, 700, and not all the way up from 400. It just it went on a bit too long. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was great, but it could have been a few minutes shorter. Yeah. yeah. All right, so it's time for the Women's Tag Team Championship match. Sadly, it's also our last pay-per-view appearance of...
then we got the golden gr- sorry the glamour girl. <laughs> this is dotted <laughs> the glamour girls Judy Martin and Leilani Kai versus the jumping bomb angels in a 2 out of 3 falls match for the women's tag titles jumping bomb angels they had a theme song and Fink did the voiceover really uh, they didn't pay for the theme they dubbed it out and put in a stock theme and got Fink to record it that's what he does in WWE today he records over it so they don't have to pay uh, why would they pay for like Justin Roberts and Tony Chimmel if you've got him he's still 10 times better than everyone I guess they're cheaper that's it but they're that's the only thing I can think of but they're still paying for him to be on the books though mm. is it just because he's old yeah, yeah but Vince is old yeah but he's not on TV every week he was just on a youth kick Jerry Lawler's old he's older than JR really yeah wow oh, he looks 20 years yeah and Golden Girls they were champions you remember Velvet McIntyre and like Princess Victoria <laughs> yeah the, uh, the match n- never happened <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it was half Moolah, half Pat Patterson. They were the NWA uh, women's tag belts, which Velvet McIntyre and Princess Victoria brought in. Then suddenly the Glamour Girls had them, and that was because they just never had a match, but just said, oh yeah, they had a match, and the belts have changed hands. Why they couldn't do it on TV makes no sense. Just like Pat Patterson winning the IC belt in the Fictitious Tournament in Rio de Janeiro, the Glamour Girls beat Velvet McIntyre and that, uh, in a fictitious match in Egypt. Ooh, why do they pick such foreign lands? Because it makes them seem more international. Yeah, both, okay, you know, fair enough. Getting out of the regional areas. Yeah, you know? okay, okay. Sure, that's why JCP changed to WCW because it has world in it. A <laughs> <The> world. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that pissed me off. I think it's going to be the same thing that pissed me off. Go on. Is that Vince admitted he doesn't know the names of the jumping bomb? That's angels. exactly what that infuriated me, and Joe made me more angry. <laughs> He called them the pink and red angels, despite the fact that the pink was clearly wearing purple. He doesn't know his colours. <laughs> Vince McMahon. Oh, gosh. Red is Izuki and pink is Narino. Halfway through the match, someone gets in his ear and tells him which one's which. That's true. Vince doesn't really get on his case for that, actually. That's because he didn't know either. Yeah. And it's not like it's their first time to ever wrestle. Jesse Ventura has called their match three months earlier and he knew which one was uh, Izuki. Yeah. So why doesn't he know now? I, I'd be more pissed as Vince McMahon because you hired them and you brought them in and you're showcasing them. Well, in kayfabe, Vince didn't hire them though. I, I know, but like... Jack Tunney. Te- like, he legitimately doesn't know their names when yeah. it came across. He did, his character doesn't know them. <laughs> Vince McMahon's <laughs> announcing character doesn't know any moves either. Oh, yeah, holy <laughs> shit. Both bomb angels have put on a good bit of weight since their last match. It's true, it's true. Mm. Um, I felt overall they had a more disappointing match than at the Survivor Series. Yeah. I wonder how much of that was the fact that they were working with the Glamour Girls for the full match. There was no Velvet McIntyre and just simply the fact that we expected more because of the great match yeah, last yeah, time. Yeah. The Jumping Bomb Angels, she set up a pile driver but then just kind of fell back into a kind of half suplex. That's, yeah, um, all, all the girls did that. And I think Andre does it as well. It's it's like a delayed double underhook botch. <laughs> it's terrible looking. To be honest, I'd rather take the botch than risk taking a pile driver from a woman. Like yeah, yeah, yeah fair enough. I, I'd just be worried. That's about not it. being sexist. That's just being safe. It's strength wise as well because yeah. you need a fair whack of it to do it correctly. Even I'm definitely not of Judy Marth. Yeah. Anyway, even like grizzled veterans, like when they do pile drivers, they might just kind of land to the side as opposed to straight down. You know, yeah. just just because it's safer. You know, stereo figure fours to the glamour girls I loved this spot I thought it was great jumping bomb angels worked the legs of Kai one of them did the triple H Indian death lock spot at some point oh, yeah. you know the one you know where he wraps up their their, their legs and then keeps on uh, jumping onto his back that's what that is oh, yeah it's the, the triple H spot <laughs> I thought it was great and then she uh, turned it into a lovely bow and arrow mm. Judy gets tagged in but it's an illegal tag because her foot wasn't on the ground she had to get an extra bit of height on the rope yeah the ref gave out about it and then allowed it but they do that nowadays like Ray Ray does that all the time surely because he's tiny technically you also need to hold the rope the rope the corner but it seemed like they just left him away with it because Leilani Kai was she looked fucked totally gassed it was very weird because the glamour girls were kind of dominant heels in Survivor Series but the Jungle Bomb Angels were in control of the first fall so I just found it a bit weird mm. you know Kai sneaks in kicked to the back and Judy hits an alley-oop do you remember Big Show used to use that? 
and get step four. That's right, yeah. I don't know what it's called, but I always think about the spot where Kane and Taker were just tagging for the first time, and Taker was trying to teach Kane how to do the last ride power bomb. Every time he'd do it, he's so powerful that he'd throw them over his head. I thought it was awesome. That's great. When yeah. did about to that? Oh, I haven't been around in Invasion time, so 2001 um, maybe. That's cool. Just prior to the first fall, there was a couple of cool spots. I'm going to praise Judy Martin. Oh. She gasp shock horror. She hit a really good rebound suplex splash. She had her up for a suplex and she bounced her off the top rope and back for a splash. Thought it was a really good spot. Going on for the alley oop. Yeah, yeah. Terrible fucking name. Like. Yeah, it's bad. Jesus. And it's for bad. Big Show as well. So. Then again, the Big Show did used to play basketball. Mm. So did Kevin Nash. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, fair enough. It looks like a botch, the move as well. It looks like you were going for something else. And it doesn't look like as much a botch as uh, Sin Cara's new <laughs> finisher. You've seen it. The La Mystica it, without the... Without the uh, fucking uh, arm bar, like... <laughs> Jesus Christ, it just looks like he's botched the move. Yeah. yeah. Terrible, terrible idea. <laughs> Second ball here, Judy hits a flying forearm, aka the what a maneuver. <laughs> uh, Vince finally gets fed the name Suzuki and Norino. Norino had a beautiful bridge from a pin from uh, Lady Lani Kai. Red counters an assumed dominator, which almost knacked herself into a sunset flip for the three at uh, the title match. So third ball is uh, tied one apiece. Azuki had an awful insiguri to the shoulder. Judy blocks the head chop. <laughs> it looks really odd. <laughs> Uh, atomic drop without the knee, so uh, just picking people up and land them on their arms. Bet you that hurts. Um, yeah, yeah, probably much worse than an atomic drop. Uh, did you notice that Leilani Kai at some point was biting fingers? I love that. It was great, wasn't Straight it? Out of I seven. knew you'd love that move. <laughs> Were the glamour girls really glamorous back in the eighties? Like, did anyone <laughs> look at them and go, "God, I'd love to be them"? <laughs> anyone. No, no. Okay. No, I, I, Let's grab I, I the fucking just, state of them. Like. I, I have to think that that's as close as they could get without being called the Golden Girls. Because like. that was big in the fucking 70s I and early 80s. I loved that show when I was Sorry, early yeah. 80s. They were wearing old woman, the stockings, you know. Yeah. That are like, These cover up my varicose veins. <laughs> yeah. Nereo missed a top rope knee, which I thought looked horrible. A nice couple of uh, double underhook suplexes another beautiful bridge by uh, Noreno I think was from a fisherman suplex mm. like like a perfect flex we got a double top rope drop kick to Judy and jumping ball mantles get the win and the tag belts as Jesse correctly disputes Judy's shoulder was actually up yeah it was. Vince just basically went shut up Jesse and he stopped talking about it <laughs> yeah it was a really bad botch so overall still still like great for a women's match but just a bit disappointing coming down from the Survivor Series yeah it was definitely better than uh, most women's matches you ever see it wasn't as good as 87 and it was better than Rude versus Steamboat yeah, if you can have a better match than Steamboat, then you're going. You go. are good. Yeah. You are good. Sorry, my girl. My God, you are done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Vince and Venture recount the development since WrestleMania 3. So at WrestleMania 3, uh, there's a dispute over Andre getting the three count when Hogan couldn't press slam him. Then the million dollar man says he'll buy the belt. Hogan says, Hell no! <laughs> <laughs> Middle Daughter Man uh, says he'll bite off Andre then, so he buys off Andre. He'll deliver the belt to him after their match at February 5th, the main event. Which main event. Shown so we get the contract signing for the next WWF title match between Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan. I hated this segment. I thought it was shit. You know, I thought there was a couple of awesome things about it. Number one, Ted DiBiase's suit was awesome. Yeah. It was a rocking suit. It was sparkly silver and purple. It doesn't get much better than that. So this is the first show we've actually seen him in the ring, in the presence for. Cause That's true, yeah, because in the last show it was just a promo package for him. In a montage. Yeah. First thing I noted was the tiny table and chairs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this table here. <laughs> what is going on? The Japanese table. <laughs> Is it just to emphasize their size, like a little? Maybe, yeah, maybe. They had wrestling tables back in the 80s, so yeah. they just could have used one of them. Probably would have broke <laughs> immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so they actually use a, you know, a dining table from Argos. Andre takes his time before sitting down in you know, a bit of mind games, which looked great. I love his... The fans were going mental waiting for it. You know I'm not the biggest fan of Andre, yeah. you know, I think he's quite bland, but by doing nothing, he was doing great here. I love how he dresses. 
He because no one else dresses like they're in the seventies. No, he looks so funny. <laughs> He's got his own dress sense as well because everyone else is wearing those uh, loud pants and the odd like zuba pants. Yeah, the zuba like. pants. Yeah. I bet you Andre is like wears the same style of clothes as he did the day he set foot on American soil kind of thing. <laughs> like he just could, he just didn't change his style. Like I think part of what makes him awesome, besides booking, is that he's a native French speaker as well. So when he speaks English, it's a bit off. Yeah. As well, you know. Well, having an accent was always a big help in wrestling. Mm. Makes you different, you know. Plus, uh, you know, he's gigantic, so he does his bone structure is a bit different as well. So, that massive brow. Like. Yeah. So as opposed to just a large person. You know. I think it's his teeth that freak me out. They look like piranha teeth almost, you know? Like uh, when you can see a gap between each tooth. Yeah, his voice as well. I thought it was really cool. It's like when he's saying, Hulk Hogan, I'm coming for your soul. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hulk Hogan was wearing purple. <laughs> he looked like a widget. <laughs> Google that, lads. <laughs> Widget the world watcher. That's awesome. And he didn't have his eye patch or tassels. That's true. It's true. Serious time, man. Yeah. Uh, the middle daughter man goes Hogan until he signs the contract. Andre stalls, then he signs. And then uh, Andre grabs Hogan's head and slams it into the table and upturns it and then he leaves. So yeah, this was a giant time fill and just to promote their next match at uh, Saturday Night's Main Event. Hogan actually did a really, really good job of looking nervous while waiting for Andre to actually sign it. I thought he sold it really, really well. DiBiase as well cut a pretty decent promo. He was such a great character. Very 80s, very strong character. Royal Rumble match. Probably noticed already, but Pat Patterson came up with the idea. Mm -hmm. He was like, all right, you know the Battle Royal where it's 20 men start in the ring. What if we did it the opposite way around where they come in? So you get one every two minutes. And I was like, man, that is a fucking amazing idea. It's a great idea. It's my favorite match in all of wrestling. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. don't think anything can even come close to it. Definitely. So this is their trial run and it was successful. And so, yeah, here we go. Here's a new yeah. pay-per-view. Here we go. Fink uh, went through the rules, which are comparatively short compared to how long it will get. Like, I remember Royal Rumble 98. Uh, he's actually taking so long that Jerry Lawler starts giving out to him and starts going, shh, boo. To a thing? Yeah. Really? Who really? doesn't know the rules of the Royal Rumble by now? Well, okay, fair enough in 88, because it's the first one. But, like, in 98, like, who needs to hear the rules of the Royal Rumble? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like. 20 men and two-minute intervals, which is a bullshit lie. I noticed Brett put on it. He, like, he didn't have his shades on, but when Fink started talking, he put on his shades so he could be announced with his shades on. That's great. And he was doing this little hand thing yeah, for the, ages. The, the Jew. Yeah. <laughs> Fiddler in the ring. <laughs> Sorry, that's just what I associated with. Brett is number one and Tito Santana is number two and they start the match. It was a very, very good opening between the both of them. I thought it looked nice and quick, nice and crisp. Very, very good choice. And of course, you've got the plot line history with both tag teams and the Hard Foundation were the tag champs and they lost it to Tito and Martel. So I thought it was a really good opening. Then uh, Butch Reed came in. He wasn't wearing Hogan Yellow. That's true. Except he looked like a bottle of Dooley's. <laughs> You can look that one up as well. Yeah, the heels dominate Tito until Jake the Snake Robert comes in and dumps Butch Reed out. Man, Jake was over. He was over like that. Holy over. shit. In less than a year, he, he went from being on Mania 3 in one of the matches that nobody gave a shit about. Wrestling, a, a wrestler who nobody gave a shit about. To then uh, at Survivor Series at 87, uh, his move was pretty over. But then at this, holy shit, the crowd were rabid for him. He was... Just the entire Rumble match, they were like, <gasps> DDT, DDT! The whole match, yeah. Uh, it was great, so there's a running thing throughout this match where he's trying to get it on Danny Davis, and he'd somehow escape. There's part of it where he's toying with Danny Davis and parts where he escapes, so I thought that was a lot of fun. Anvil sells a beard pull from Jake. Yeah! <laughs> I, I thought that was great, and I also thought it was very good booking to have Anvil in number four, so that him and Brett could double team on Tito. Yeah. Jake Roberts, number five. Harley Race, number six. Number seven. 
one of the killer bees, Jim Brunzel. This is uh, via closed circuit in arenas, but more prominently now since we're 1988, more pay-per-views. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't get the pay-per-view in the bees' hometown. They didn't have cable, only antennas. <laughs> <laughs> and number eight is Sam Houston. Is Sam Houston the Red Rooster? No, no, that's Terry Taylor. That's Terry Taylor. Then who's this guy with his <laughs> little necktie, like his neckerchief? <laughs> He's the precursor to Steve Austin. <laughs> Boring bland baby face, he should be teaming up with like Jim Rude Howard. temperature Steve Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Danny Davis is number nine, and Boris Zukov number ten, size of his head. Big suitcase on his shoulders. He does, he does have a big fat head. <laughs> I think, uh, did you make note of just how awful Harley Race looked at this point? Jesse Ventura had a few digs at him over speed as well. Mm -hmm. I know, which I thought was a nice touch. Did this guy have long left after this point? No, no, he is definitely on the way. This is what he does. He just either come in for the, to make up the numbers or to put over new guys. Right, That's okay. Which is, which is fine. With a lot of the wrestlers now. Though. Yeah, better than what like TNA do with their old guys, you know? Sting Hogan, <laughs> bound for club. Oh, anyway, um, race does a honky spot where he teeters on the rope getting a punch from Jake. Oh, <laughs> it's so bad looking, the fucking state of it. Morocco comes out and Volkov follows him, only catching Morocco when they reach the ring. I thought it was hilarious. Morocco clocks Volkov and then gets in the ring, but Volkov has to stay outside and I'm like, why aren't they sending him back to the back? Oh, so how did this happen? How did they get mixed up? Like, surely they, they know who's coming out next. I'd have to think that this was a spot. <laughs> I don't know, or else Volkov just came out and he was like, oh shit, I'm actually through the curtain. Just, just keep going. This is now a storyline. <laughs> <laughs> Morocco clocks Volkov and gets in the ring. Ventura drops Barry Bloom reference, which I didn't get. I have no idea. I no. I don't know. Volkov was the next entrant, so that kind of makes a bit more sense. And it feels like he just came out too early then. Yeah. He was number 12. This guy looked old by this point and... Uh, next was number 13, it was Jim Duggan. He got a massive pop, he was over. He was over like Robert. The fans love his hoes, like. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what pisses me off, actually? When people on the net write who for that. Who? <laughs> <laughs> and they do the flair as well. The who? <laughs> rather than woo. Just two things that piss me off. That's amazing. Rather than me. You misspelled. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Dogan comes out. Oh, this is amazing. I thought it was... I just flipped out when I saw it. Dogan comes out, but Race is still at the entrance because he hasn't gotten out yet. And Dogan sees him. <laughs> And he slaps him in his chest, you know, to move, like, and then race kind of clothesline him, but he doesn't sell it. Like, he kind of just kind of clips him around in the throat. Yeah, and that was really funny. And then he runs away, and then Duggan runs after him, but then thinks better of it and goes back into the ring. Yeah, probably a fuck up, but, uh, like, the fans were just up for everything at this point, especially the DDT and Duggan. Like. Every time Jake is on offense, they'll start chanting for DDTs, you know? I just noticed because they're chanting DDT, DDT, and then the crowd goes silent when Ron Bass comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Hawk, like. <laughs> I was thinking of like when we were cheering that match with uh, Joey Legend in it. And oh. then he was like, yeah, yeah, and turned around and points at us. He just turned around. <laughs> <laughs> we are not clapping you, mate. No, not Joey Legend. Brian B. Blair, he kind of tagged the camera by mistake, he pushed it. Duggan is over. He holds Dangerous Danny Davis sideways so Jake can get uh, like a double axe handle off the top. He holds him 90 degrees to him. Oh, okay, right. Like, do you know the stupid thing they do where they're, whoever's holding him is actually in the same line? So kind of that'd be Ducks, he'll get a smack? Like. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's well, actually quite... quite hold, hold on the bike. That's quite right. Danny Davis actually does have the worst ring gear I've ever seen. Worse than Terry Funk? Which is made out of a circus carnival tent. Yeah, I, I'd say yeah. I, <laughs> I'd say yeah. He, it looks like he's wearing it nappy as well. Like. <laughs> uh, that doesn't help. Like. Maybe he gave it to Christian. <laughs> Number 18, I was like, oh my god, it's the warrior. Oh, I've got this written in massive bold letters. He's wearing Hogan's red and yellow. And he looks so young in it. Oh, holy shit. Like, not quite as ripped as he would be come either. He's green as grass though. A uh, former chiropractor. Is that yeah, yeah. Jim Helwig. Jim Helwig, yeah. He teamed up with Sting uh, in the UWF as the Blade Runners. That's right. And his the Dingo name... Warriors as no, well, no, right? No, no, no. He was known as Rock. Really? <laughs> yeah, in, as Blade Runners. It's when he went to World Class, he was the Dingo Warrior. 
Oh. Um, he was signed in the summer of 87, but he was... And what was um, Borden called uh, as part of the Blade Runners? Hard place, like. God. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just Sting. Really? Rock and Sting. Rock and Sting. It was a shame that uh, the Killer Bees never went to WCW, because they could have teamed up with Sting. Nice. <laughs> Morocco eliminates Brett. Uh, he had a very impressive performance. He was like 20... You could say I was pollen for the bees. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it was Brett 25 minutes. Man, well, that was a big push for him. Yeah, he kind of kept the early part of the match going. Uh, you know, like once it filled up, he was just like another body in there. The time was never kept to two minutes. It was like 1.40 or it was like, you know, spot to spot. It was never actual time, which I'm fine with, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, the time between Warrior and One Man Gang was 50 seconds. Really? Um, That's probably because it took One Man Gang about 1 minute and 10 seconds to get <laughs> into the ring. Like. I just have to say, whenever Vince is confronted with this kind of, you know, n numbers, details, that kind of thing, he says that the numbers are for entertainment purposes only. So. They're not real numbers. None of it's real. Any time they say anything, it's just for entertainment. Don't take any of it as gospel. Really? Yeah. So then why did Fink spend 15 minutes explaining the rules? <laughs> Maybe he didn't have the rule book. God! Oh, <laughs> threw it in the bin. Vince and Brooklyn in the bin. <laughs> One Mind Gang um, eliminates uh, Brunzel and Jake, so no DDT tonight. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Brunzel even came off like a star, and, you know, this crowd was so hot for them, like... Bravo eliminated the Warrior with absolutely no fanfare. <sighs> So it was down to Don Morocco, uh, One Mind Gang, Dino Bravo, and Jim Duggan as the final four. There was a lot of eliminations actually close to the end. Yeah, like the, the like the four kind of ten or fifteen minutes of match was building them up, and it just kind of knocked everybody down in, in about what five minutes. Mm. It was kind of like fifteen eliminations. Yeah, number twenty was Jumpyard Dog. And it lasted about a minute in the match? Yeah. Two thoughts, really. Is that uh, one of them, when one my gang, he eliminated like six people. He yeah. Was, uh, when people are thrown out, it feels like if you were a big guy, you can't skin the cat, so actually you're going out. If you were a smaller guy, or, you know, like Steamboat, you could have skinned the cat and stayed in. Yeah. Like, because Brett would get thrown out and get tied up in the ropes or whatever, but not like Morocco or something. You know, he'd get tapped and he'd jump over. He could try hold on to the ropes, but you're not skinning the cat, so that's fine. The other thing is, number 20 is JYD, so no Macho Man. Where, where, where's Macho Man? Yeah, and, and where's Honky? Where's a Honky? I fucking love Honky. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta wait till uh, Saturday night's main event for that. Yeah, bullshit. Where's Honky and where's yeah. Savage? Don Rocco does two commando rolls to get away from the heels. I didn't see that. Uh, he also broke out of a couple of nice uh, drop kicks as well. I was shocked at So the two heels kick out Morocco, and then we're left with two heels on Jim Duggan, and One Mind Gang mistakenly eliminates Dina Bravo when Jim Duggan ducked out of the way. And then we get pretty much the same thing. One man guy runs at Jim Duggan, he pulls down the top rope and yeah. eliminates and wins. And so Jim Duggan is the winner of the first ever Royal Rumble. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, at the time, it was, eh, let's have Duggan win it. But looking back at it, what's it, like 23 years ago? That means a lot in terms of history. You're the winner of the first ever Rumble, it's huge. I thought he was probably the right person to win it. Either him or uh, Roberts, because the fans were mental for that's, two of them. That's exactly what I thought. I was initially annoyed, like, historically, because I'm never a big Jim Duggan fan. Mm. But I was like, oh, man, this is a job where you should have thought this true, you know? He did, without question, the best job of working the crowd, I think, on this whole show. Because every five seconds he's screaming, ho, and the fans go mental. Yeah, yeah. Totally so crazy. it was between Jim Duggan and Jake Roberts is most over in the match, so it's totally. right that he should have won. Like, yeah. If you weren't going to give it to Jake Roberts. Yeah, totally. So there's half an hour left in the pay-per-view despite the Rumble and the world title signing being done. So this is about the time when I checked out. We got uh, Hogan with Craig the George who cuts a standard crowd pandering promo. And then we're into the final match of the night. This is the only time we'll see a tag match main event of pay-per-view. Oh, I was so angry. I forgot all about this match. I thought the Rumble was the main event. And then when this came out, I, I was like, hold on a minute. The Rumble's not the main event. And then I was like, hold on another minute. <laughs> it's the second two out of three falls tag match in a fucking hour, like. 
How lazy is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really fucking lazy. Oh, I, I just want to know part of it. Why really? didn't you have Hunky vs. Savage as the main event then if you weren't going to do it? The gimmick of the Islanders, which they really repeatedly bang on about, is that the Islanders have kidnapped Matilda and she's still kept captive. So that's Matilda being the Bulldog's dog. Vince Vince Bulldog. and Jesse Ventura spent about, I'd say about two thirds of the first fall talking about this dog. They cared about the same as I did about this match. I'm not going to lie, I don't really have much written on it. Uh, Couldn't be worse than me. I've basically it's written... Me. <laughs> that's, I think that's me there. Um, basically, what I've written about this match is Vince is talking about anything except the match. Then my next line is, I actually don't care about this match. <laughs> this is the equivalent of putting on the women's match after the world title. Well, in today's standards. Yeah, yeah, by, by now. There was actually one very good spot in this. Roma gets pulled over the top rope and uh, sells his knee really, really well. Like, I imagine most people there thought Paul Roma was hurt. And he gets counted out to lose the first fall. I just thought that was a really good spot. And then to make me really angry, they re-show the fucking contract signing for like the fourth time tonight. They re-show it again. However, then we get a decent promo with uh, the Million Dollar Man and Virgil. And it's during the match. They took a break after the first fall oh. and showed the promo. Basically, Ted DiBiase, great. He, he just cuts a good promo saying, you know, just dropping loads of uh, cliches about money and Hogan is overdrawn and that. <laughs> I'll cash this check and get my world title. He must title. have loved this crow <laughs> he, he was great. Jim Paris is is a decent enough worker and he is fucking huge. He's a roid monkey. He's a big guy. He's a good looking guy. He's a decent worker. And I'm like, what would have happened if they had a stuck the warrior gimmick on this guy? Because he looks like warrior and he's a far better worker. Is he as tall? I I don't think he's as tall, but you know, he looks big enough. Yeah. Like He's wider. Yeah. Like, um, I, you know, I don't know if this guy's a good talker or not but you know just just in terms of look like um, the only thing is can anyone else cut a warrior promo I think Savage can Sa cut a warrior I think Savage yeah uh, <laughs> I think but, that's a bit of, uh, did you know, notice a spot where no, uh, Tom missed his drop kick and then uh, Jim Powers sold the back yeah <laughs> I thought that, that, that was really me funny off. Yeah, and basically, yeah. the Islanders hit a top rope splash to Roma's leg, then stick him in a single leg Boston Crab and get the win. Tap out two falls to none. At 14 10. So, yeah, 2 0. And the Islanders win in the main event with a pretty flat main event. Very flat main event. It was nice to see them end in two uh, falls. Two. <laughs> that was mercy falls. like. Yeah. Uh, good finish, but I don't care. You just have another 20 minutes to fill here, stick on this match. They really should have thought about it and put on Savage and Honky. Like, if you want people to tune into the next one, maybe we've already shilled the next show to you right. via the contract signing, so who cares now, you know? I don't know, but it's, it's like, it was building up to Honky Savage with, remember, like, Honky ran away at the end of the 5-on-5 five -five match yeah. at, at the series and things like that, you know, but... Because Vince really wanted more pay-per-views because the product is so hot at the moment. You know, if we only have one pay-per-view a year, there's only one big payday. So more pay-per-views, the fans want to see it. I want to give it. I want to make more money. So yeah, yeah. let's do it. Just as a bonus add-on, let's go now to the main event, February 5th, uh, 1988. It's a rematch from WrestleMania 3. It's Hulk Hogan as champion versus Andre the Giant. Another great Million Dollar Man promo. Lots of money references. Andre does his scary eyes thing, and he says that he's going to choke Hogan and squeeze it, and he looked fucking scary here. I thought this was a great promo. Next, we go to uh, Hogan promo with uh, Mean Gene. Millions of reasons to become the World Wrestling Federation Heavyweight Champion. Well, with all the controversy, Mean Gene, from WrestleMania 3, I've tried to keep an open mind, man. But I've viewed the film a thousand and one times. Andre the Giant, you only had me down for a two count. I slammed you and beat you one, two, three, right in the middle. Maybe the players, the violence, and the training is small change to you, multi-million dollar man. But I've invested my three assets wisely in a lifelong profit-sharing plan with all my little holsters, brother. Virgil, you watch the referee. That's cool. All my Hulkamaniacs are going to be watching you, multi-million dollar man. Then Andre the Giant, 
one on one with the whole world watching. I'm going to prove to you I can beat you, and Hulkamania will live forever. All right, ladies and gentlemen, head it to the ring, Hulk Hogan. He looks coked out of it. He's just, he's shaky and he's fidgety and he's literally bursting it out of the skin and this was a very very strange uh, promo and then Hogan did a really bizarre outro over his promo where it looked like he was doing a bad moonwalk out of the camera <laughs> that was shot that amazing I don't know I had no idea what it was it was like yeah it was like some kind of Harley's like <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome and that was great next we're on to the actual match and uh, I thought Hogan's entrance was fantastic Roiling up the fans, and he was going for Andre, and the ref was holding him back. I thought he was great, and really, really super stuff here from Hogan. Andre takes an age to get into the ring, and he totally milks it, and the fans are egging him on, and Hogan is making the fans go worse. So it's just really, really great. Hogan then knocks Debussy and Virgil off the ring apron with a, a double noggin knocker and then batters Andre for ages. Andre looks exhausted after about 30 seconds of kind of half selling. He looked out of sorts in this match. So Hogan batters Andre for a while, eventually goes up to the top rope, but Andre does the flare spot on him. You know, he give him a like a power slam off the top. Mm. While he's doing it, he gives Hogan a massive finger of foot. <laughs> his finger goes right up there it's Andre's like, finger yeah this is like a fucking German sausage like, you know what I mean <laughs> Andre takes control for a minute Hogan kind of hulks back up and the plot of this match from now on is that Hogan can't knock Andre off his feet and no matter what he does Hogan can't do it so eventually Andre knocks Hogan down again Goes for a diving headbutt, but misses. This brings on about a five-minute choke spot, because Andre was clearly wrecked at this point. More choking, and uh, even more choking. <laughs> and then another hulk up, and the fans go absolutely mental at this point. Hogan batters Andre again, hits a diving clothesline from the second rope which I've never seen Hogan do. I thought it was pretty cool. He hits the leg drop, but Virgil gets the ref's attention, so he can't count it. So Hogan gets up to get the ref's attention back, allowing Andre to grab Hogan from behind, like he did last year prior to the Mania match. He hits him a couple of headbutts to the back of the head, then his terrible botched underhook suplex pins Hogan, who kicks out after one, but the ref somehow doesn't see it, and counts the three, and awards... Andre the title. Mm. Mm. Well, let's see. Overall, this wasn't a bad match. It was probably better than the Mania Three match. Uh, shorter as well, which made a big difference. And the first five minutes was uh, Andre taking advice from Million Dollar Man. Yeah, yeah. The crowd are just so loud. You know, it's hard not to get wrapped up in it when the crowd are just going yeah, mental. Yeah, you know? they're they're absolutely mental. They're just loving. Like they're they're so into both characters that it doesn't really matter what they do. Like they are going to get behind what both of these guys do. Mm. I'm glad as well, we're only halfway through the Hulkamania or whatever, but I'm glad to see Hogan lose. God, this guy, he just <laughs> looks unbeatable. Much. This is actually two shows in a row where Hogan's lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you like that? But, um, so what happens uh, afterwards? Andre gets on the mic and cuts a barely uh, audible promo. You can't really hear what he's saying because the fans are just doing so much. That's and, awesome. And plus, you know, he's very out of breath yeah. and very French. And then hands the belt to the million dollar man who then gloats at Hogan in a really awesome way. Hogan looks pissed and the fans are pissed as well. Then, somehow, Dave and other Dave Hebner are arguing in the ring. There's two referees. There's two referees. There's two Dave Hebners, according to uh, Vince and Jesse Ventura. And they don't know who's who, and who is the real one, and who's the fake one. Hogan looks confused, and then grabs both of them, right? So then he lets them go. Then the two twins uh, continue to fight, and one batters the other. But we don't know who's battered who. But Hogan and Ventura think it's Dave Hebner because he's taken money. <laughs> but he doesn't have any money on him. <laughs> and uh, so then Hogan grabs the, uh, let's call him the evil twin, and uh, plays to the crowd. And they're going mental. They're really up for it. Gorilla presses him, runs to the rope, and throws him to the heels. But he throws him so hard 
that he throws him over the heels and he lands uh, on the entrance ramp like and it looks really really painful this was a half decent match and uh, what a great a ending really good angle like yeah. you know I uh, in 88 I'd probably seen nothing like this before you know I was kind of hoping that they do some kind of stupid uh, corny mirror spot where Dave doesn't realise he has a twin and he like when he puts up his left hand how does he not realise he has a twin like <laughs> He's only shared a womb for nine months. <laughs> yeah, you know, and probably like a bedroom for 20 years, you know? <laughs> you know, if he left, if he raised his left hand, the other guy was raised his like, right hand at the same time. That would be great. And they start pointing at each other at the same time. <laughs> that would be an awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, one last thing. Is this the uh, first ever instance of twin magic? The Royal Rumble, January 24th, 1988, from the Cox Coliseum in Hamilton, Ontario, in Canada. On the USA Network, the attendance was 18,000, and it was announcers Vince McMahon and Jesse Ventura. Ricky Steamboat, it be Rick Rude by DQ at 17 minutes, in a pretty disappointing mm. match, really. Disappointing, uh, not great, not recommended. It Sh- should have been better. It was just one armbar, yeah. the whole match, and then there was and- spurts of bad psychology as well. Then we got the Jumping Bomb Angels that won 2-1 and claimed the WWF Women's Tag Titles. You know, quite entertaining in Canada. Uh, yeah. Um, Against uh, the Glamour Girls. I enjoyed this match. It was nowhere near as uh, good as at Survivor Series 87, but uh, still better than most women's matches you'll ever see. They only brought back the WWF Ladies Tag Championships for this feud. The belts would disappear this summer. Oh, would they? Yeah. You know, it was nice for the big win at the time, but then there is absolutely no follow-up. Yeah. Why not just say these women are from all Japan, they're the tag champions, and they're willing to take on anyone. And they're, they fecked off, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it, the women's match was very over. Like So these girls would be a great addition to have at every pay-per-view, hmm? you know? But I guess he just didn't want to push women as wrestlers, just keep them as valets for the time being. Because they do, the women's division stuff does make a comeback in a couple of years, you know? Yeah, that's true. Anyway, it was a shame because there was definitely enough good characters and talents to actually have a women's division back in the late 80s, anyway. Alright, then we have Hogan and Andre signing uh, for their match uh, February 5th, uh, next month at the main event in Saturday Night's main event. Then we have Jim Duggan winning the inaugural Royal Rumble in, yeah, quite an entertaining match. I totally enjoyed it, yeah. No storyline to the match. No, nothing. And people just went over the top. My biggest problem with it was, in other way, in modern rumbles, they kind of come in two sections. You've got the early part with the mid characters and their feuds, and people that are feuding will knock each other out, and you'll start new feuds off it, and then clear out the ring at some point. Yeah. And then, and then the main eventers start coming in. That didn't happen, but you know, it was the first ever rumble. It was more about having something so different that uh, I thought it was good. Mm, yeah, I tremendously thoroughly successful. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Dino Bravo, under suspicious circumstances, breaking the under world awesome press. circumstances <laughs> uh, record. And yeah, then we had the uh, terrible one on main event with uh, a two out of three falls match again with the Islanders and Wild Stallions. This main event was nothing. Uh, I was glad when it was over. I couldn't care less. Let's just give out a few awards here. MVP of this show. I've only got one name written down. That, my friend. Is Jesse the Body Ventura for the fourth show in a row? No questions. I thought he was by far the MVP of this show. We have him last week as well. Yeah, and I've had him for many two and three. Wow. Yeah, that's how awesome this guy is. However, Heenan came close. Uh, I'm gonna go for a Bret Hart. I thought he put a sterling performance in at the Royal Rumble. Definitely made that match. Like, if he wasn't in that match, it would have been much worse. Like, you would yeah. be the same with Jim Powers. Uh, it would have been a lot worse. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. Although Ventura is amazing. It's just, he, he made yeah. the Dino Bravo segment as well. Like, I thought he was awesome. Yeah. yeah. And Virgil Award, biggest gimp of the night. Biggest jobber. I have three names down. Who pissed you off the most? 
Vince McMahon. Yeah, shit, that's my choice. Yeah, Vince McMahon. <laughs> yeah, I, I hated his commentary. He's ignorant yeah. and so false sounding. Yeah. You know? I, I'll be first with I did enjoy his commentary when I was a kid, and even up until he left in 97, but it's like going back on it, yeah, it's bad. so awful. He's bad. He graded on me. He runs the company. I know in KFAB he doesn't, he's just commentator, but you know, he runs the company and his character knows nothing about his own company. Fuck off. Bitch. Didn't even know the names of his tag champions. Yeah, like. of his women's tag champions. Yeah. yeah. Who else do you have down there? Butch Reed, because mm. he just comes out, he does nothing with his battle of doolies and fucks off. <laughs> and uh, Zukov, because he's awful. <laughs> he was pretty awful, but he is interesting to look at. I don't <laughs> he looks like a very large... I don't enjoy people with fat heads, like, you know what he I mean? He looks like such a, like an, like a, a giant evil baby. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with the I'll agree with that, the, like. The, the beard, like. The Roydy Magoo. Roydy Magoo. This, this was tough. I have three... <laughs> this was a tough one. Yeah. I have three names again, okay? Morocco, of course. Obviously. Because yeah. any show he's in, he's going to be on it. Jim Powers again. I had him down for uh, Survivor Series 87. And The Ultimate Warrior. But, um... Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to have to hold off. He the was Warrior. nowhere near as big as he would get. I'm gonna go with Morocco again. Yeah. Bollocks, I'm going with Morocco. Yeah. The honor would, would be Rick Rude as well. Holy oh, shit. Rick Rude, Jesus, yeah. yeah. Holy crap. So, it's just Morocco is that much older. Yeah. But his skin is still that bulky and tiny. He's scary looking. Though. Whenever you get close up shots of him, the, his uh, big tortuous veins like are disgusting. Yeah, yeah. He should start talking to the Golden Girls about where they get their tights and things like that. Like. <laughs> His tets, like. <laughs> oh god, that's awesome. All right. Wrestling is awesome. 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 I came to All right, all right. So let me get this straight. Renee's gonna try to reopen the portal to the dimension that the demon came from. Jay and Summer are going to try to force the demon back into the portal. And what exactly is it that Ricky's doing? We have gone over this. You know what you're doing, Ricky. Oh, let me just say it out loud so it sticks. I'm the bait! You got it. Oh, balls to that! Oh, you're a man. Be a man. What the hell is that supposed to mean? You're so tough, why don't you do it? Because I need to make sure that the demon goes back into the portal. None of you can go head to head with it. Fine. And what about her? I can read some stupid magic trick. Why don't you do it? Because the second I turn my back, you screw my girlfriend. She was a demon! You didn't know that at the time. Please. It was so obvious. And yet you still screwed her. She was an incredible witch. Crazy powers. Ricky, you can do this. I'll go. For once in my life, I'll be the hero. Wish me luck. Are you ready? So next time we've got WrestleMania 4 with 14 man tournament to determine the new WWF champion. Alright, so signing out, it's me, Jay Hunter, with Steve. Take care, guys. Alright, signing out.